the challenges from uh, social determinants of health, if that is a, a phrase that you're familiar with, you know, the, the differences in, in people's health based upon where they are in their lives and what's available to them and what's accessible to them. Uh, you know, do they have access to medical care? Do they have access to healthy foods? Do they live in a food desert? Are they impacted by toxins in their environment? I think it made me even more aware of how we need a lifestyle medicine plant-based approach that is easily accessible to everyone. You know? This is the Healthy Lifestyle Solutions Podcast, and I'm your host, Maya Acosta. If you're willing to go with me, together we can discover how simple lifestyle choices can help improve our quality of life. Let's get started. So Dr. Cheryl True is a family and lifestyle medicine physician in Davenport. She started her pod Heartland Rooted in 2016. The pod has typically held monthly meetings that consisted of a potluck with time for fellowship and an educational session. The pod has also hosted community lectures and healthy food demos, a monthly whole food plant-based meal prep workshop, and a spice blends workshop. Heartland Rooted has a website and active Facebook group and page and also keeps in contact with members by email. Dr. True has many interests and activities. She is a fellow of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, has additional training as a health and wellness coach and certificates in plant-based nutrition and plant-based cooking. She has her own businesses, True Lifestyle Medicine Clinic and LM for you, Lifestyle Medicine for you and is also medical director of the Rock Island County Health Department and director of education for Digital LM. She is a walk with a dog group leader and serves on a variety of board committees. She enjoys cycling, outdoor activities, and cooking, and she and her husband enjoy sharing their home with many pets. Welcome, Dr. True. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's good to be here. Thanks. You know, and it's exciting to know that this group exists and to be involved in this group. So Dr. True, there are so many things um, that you previously shared with me that I love for our listeners to learn about you, um, because this also helps us to understand how you came, a, came to be a PAC member. So um, we will talk about how you made a decision to go into medical school, how you learned about plant-based nutrition, how you started your pod. And you can also give us any tips when it comes to advising other pod leaders what they can do. I know that life has changed a lot right now, and so we're not meeting in person, but maybe there's a way that we can support pod leaders. And this is why we are part of the pod advisory committee. And also, I'd like to talk about your contribution to the Amer to the women's health uh, book that I've been addressing in the podcast. I've had other physicians on to talk about uh, the book as well. So I'm hoping we can cover that. And so let's first start by learning a little bit about yourself. And I want to say that you, you said to me earlier that very early on, you were not very interested in eating a lot of meat. Tell us um, a little bit about your upbringing and about that. Sure. I, I think I was a bit of a, a picky eater as a kid. I didn't like my food to touch. <laughs> and uh, I, don't, I don't remember you know, thinking that meat was you know, the be all end all of what people ate. Um, I think other things interested me more, but I also was the kid that always had a, probably a Susie Q in my lunch too. So I think when I was in maybe junior, late junior high, high school, I, I became more interested in what nutrition meant for, um, for health, uh, you know, for whatever reason. And I think I started to maybe shift my eating habits a little during that time without, you know, concrete uh, knowledge of anything, just, oh, people should eat different things to eat a healthier diet. So I, I just, I don't remember being very interested in, in meat as like the thing to eat. Um, and as I got older, I even shifted farther away from that thinking, you know, it gives me a sense that, you know, why am I eating other animals? I have all these pets and animals that are uh, special to me what's different about an animal that is being grown for food. So I, I think that shift started taking place, you know, maybe during college um, and grew stronger over the years. So now which came first, your introduction to 
plant-based nutrition or your interest in going into medical school? When I was in high school, um, I did well in school and it was in those college track classes. And I, I thought I would become a veterinarian. You know, that was from the little kid perspectives of I'll be an artist, I'll be a, um, I'll be a jockey. Um, I, I think I wanted to be a, an archaeologist at some point. And by high school, I was like, I was going to be a veterinarian. Uh, through college, uh, recognizing you know, more about what it takes as a first-generation college student, you know, even learning what, what that means uh, in context of career. And during college, I realized that veterinary medicine probably was not a good choice based upon health conditions like allergies and asthma and being allergic to animals is probably not a great way to start off your career. So decided on, on a different path uh, during college, um, kind of tried on some different majors, psychology, I think I was pre-med for a little while, and ended up with just a biology major, thinking I would go into some sort of you know, research. Um, I was very interested as a, um, in my last year of college in a field called psychoneuroimmunology. I was like, wow, this would be a really cool research field to go into. So kind of going that route um, prior to graduation, ended up with a, a major in biology. There was a, an experience that you had, and I wasn't sure if it was before or after medical school, where you were basically watching footage um, about, you know, homegrown chickens and how the family would slaughter the chickens. And then you heard, it sounded like you actually heard a chicken being slaughtered at the moment, and that really impacted you. What happened? So I uh, kind of fast forward through that graduating journey. Um, I worked for about six years, including... For a while at, uh, at Oscar Mayer, I worked in a, a research laboratory for human research at the University of Iowa, um, ended up going to medical school about six years later, and that experience that I had shared came, oh, probably maybe five years after I'd graduated from medical school. So I uh, went to medical school, um, went into family medicine, and was working in the, uh, my job. And one night I was going to go join some friends for dinner and there had been this segment on NPR while I was driving to dinner. And it was, it was talking about uh, the, the amounts of um, bacteria and stuff in, in, in chicken that you would buy at the store. And this was a solution that people had to maybe get a, a healthier product by going to this farm and picking out your chicken. And then, you know, they would process it for you and take it home. And as I was driving, you could hear the chickens clucking in the background. And, and that's such a, a relaxing sound, right? They sound content. They're out, you know, pecking around in the yard. And then all of a sudden it was this uh, in the middle of, you know, a chicken clucking. And, and it just really hit me that, oh my goodness, that, that chicken's life just ended to end up on somebody's plate. And when I got to the restaurant, I was like, okay, guys, I, I don't think I can eat chicken tonight. That really bothered me. And I never went back. Um, I did not eat meat again after that point. And that was kind of those, I'd always played with this idea of, I should be a, a vegetarian just because, you know, I, I think that looks like a healthier way to eat and it bothers me to eat the animals. So that was my, my defining moment. I didn't know it at the time, but uh, it changed that day. Wow. How old were you around that time? Probably in my late thirties. So you say you sort of played around with the idea of being a vegetarian. Does that mean that even up to that point, I think you've said you did, really didn't need a lot of meat anyway. Was it a difficult change to make? Uh, no. And it was funny because I used to actually, I'd, I'd wake up with a dream that I had eaten chicken again, you know, and it, it I could tell how much that bothered me. Uh, and I think I had enough other things to eat that it was not a problem. You know, I could, I could just eat those other things and just leave off that one thing. I think in, in our uh, chip classes, one of the videos, Dr. Deal says something about, you know, you put more and more of the good stuff on your plate and the meat just falls off the edge. And so it had fallen off my plate and didn't return. So now how did you actually come upon the information of plant-based foods? So during um, the, uh, maybe around 2013, I think, I had gone to a, a small conference and somebody was talking to me about her study. She was an internist. She was talking about her studies in functional medicine. Didn't know what that was at the time. So I started to look into functional medicine and, and I had been really kind of aware that there were things that were, were frustrating in medicine. 
um, the chronic diseases people had, we weren't ever getting rid of them. It was always one more script, one more script. And, and although I could talk to people about eating healthier or exercising, I never felt like I really had that, that direct impact to help them change those behaviors. And so uh, as I looked into the, the functional medicine field, I was like, wow, there's a lot of stuff in here that is so valuable that we don't touch on in our training. And somewhere within maybe a couple of weeks of learning about functional medicine, I had received an email about a lifestyle medicine conference. And you know, I had had this interest from even undergrad in psychoneuroimmunology, the, the connections that all the parts of our body have. And in lifestyle medicine, you know, just opening this email and saying, oh, look, this focuses on nutrition, physical activity, sleep, I mean, all these things. This is what medicine needs. This is like where our foundations of health come from. And there's, there's a behavior change to it and there's more to learn. And so that was my other defining moment, right? Of, of seeing this, this field that really embraced many of the things that I had as ideas, but maybe didn't have the context for them within the field of medicine. So you touched on behavior change. I understand that the pillars of lifestyle medicine may not necessarily be emphasized in your training in medical school, but behavior change is that so like one of the first approaches that are sort of encouraged but not highly emphasized for physicians? In other words, try this first, but if that doesn't work, then prescribe this and that. Yeah, yeah, that is a, a first line approach to many um, disease states. Uh, high blood pressure, for example, will often use that first line approach to make those lifestyle changes. Maybe you're changing your diet, maybe you're changing your exercise pattern. Um, but the training, at least when I trained in teaching people to know how to help people change their behavior was very minimal. Um, I don't think it was emphasized. I, I remember maybe a couple of lessons, but then it wasn't something that was role modeled for us or even emphasized as we as we went through our careers. Uh, behavior change that I learned through um, taking the health and wellness coach training, it, it, was, it was like a whole new toolbox that took skills that I had and then put them together into uh, a meaningful algorithm, if you wanna call it that, that gave me an approach to helping people change their behavior that could truly be effective. And so rather than giving people a, a prescription for their medicine for their diabetes, telling them to change their behaviors and then come back and see me in three months, where that usually didn't elicit behavior change. Somebody could say, well, you know, I, I went home and I did really well for a week or two. You know, I was eating differently, I, I was exercising and then life happened, right? The, country music song, <laughs> you know, my car broke down, my dog died, my you know, spouse ran away, my kid dropped out of school, you know, all of those things contribute to making it hard to um, continue on some of those pathways. And so learning those coaching skills, I think is so dramatic and really recognizing uh, what the, what the life is that your, your patient in front of you wants, what their vision is, and what kinds of things um, are they, they good at? What are their strengths? What are going to be those uh, techniques that help them to make those changes and to really define what those changes need to be, setting some goals along the way, looking at barriers and challenges and readjusting as needed. So kind of changing the, the model from here, I'm, I'm telling you you have diabetes, here's the things you should do to really engaging in a, a partnership for their health um, and then involving other team members too and making it an interdisciplinary uh, visit to perhaps help them by using a health coach or a nutritionist, a dietitian, maybe a, um, a personal trainer or somebody in PT or OT to really help them achieve those goals that they set by giving them the tools to do so. So the partnership, having a sort of team approach is what I like most about the lifestyle medicine model. Then I wanna say, I think in 2015, that's when you watched Plant Pure Nation. Yeah, so I, I joined American College of Lifestyle Medicine in 2013 and attended that conference and there were 250 people there and it was probably the most positive, energizing group of people in medicine that I had ever met and it made me um, really reinvigorated to uh, 
to look differently at what we were doing. Uh, so I, I got involved in the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, you know, continued with those annual conferences, um, sought out everything I could, I think, in between there, the key Colin Campbell, the Cornell uh, Plant-Based Nutrition course, um, CHIP Facilitator, the Ruby RX course. Uh, but in 2015, we have a, uh, an event every, I think it was the, the Tuesday night of our conference, it was the documentary. And the documentary in 2015 was Plant Pure Nation. And uh, Nelson Campbell was there. He introduced the, the documentary and then uh, talked about it afterwards. And one of the things he talked about was this formation of this pod network. So I'm sitting in the audience. I've got my tablet in front of me. And I'm like, OK, how do I become one of these pod leaders? And and at the moment, you know, I was just so excited by, by the message he had delivered and the way to look at change for people that was outside the clinic walls. You know, it was kind of meeting people where they were. And I had, I, I, I've always been a very introverted person. Getting up and talking in front of people or engaging in people in groups was never something that I would have thought would be in my future. Um, but I realized that I had a lot of information that I'd been gathering over the years that could be shared. And it was a message people needed to hear. So if I'm just keeping it in my own head or sharing it one one it's not going to impact people as much. So this pod network sounded like a really good way to get this message out into the community. So I applied to be a, a pod group leader, and um, I think there was an interview. You know, we picked uh, a name for the pod and had our first meeting. And I had a, a good friend who offered space at her university. She, you know, got a room for us to meet in, and I put flyers up coffee shops, the library, you know, whatever places. Uh, I, don't, I might have put some on social media, I don't remember. Um, but that very first meeting was, I believe, February of 2015. And I, I brought some books. I think I brought some food. I showed up not knowing what was going to happen. And people showed up. I, I want to say we had 14 people or something that first meeting. And as they walked in, I just, I remember being so struck by some of the words people said is, oh my goodness, there's somebody else who eats like me that lives here in the Quad Cities. I thought I was the only one. Um, and that, just hearing that, that somebody was no longer alone, that they had support, they had somebody else who maybe understood uh, their way of life, the, the challenges they faced, um, and could have those connections. It's the way to help grow some of those changes we need to have. Happen. And also for people who were maybe uh, trying this out, they wanted to go this way, but they didn't have support and they really needed it. This provided an area that people could come together and, and talk about how they made changes in their lives and how they stuck to them and, and the benefits that they found in eating whole foods. Um, that that plant-based approach isn't something that we typically talk about in medicine. And so having it be in this very non-threatening community environment where people could share with each other, but also we drew medical professionals in that also think plant-based eating is, is a benefit to our health. And we could share things in ways that we wouldn't do you know, in those one-on-one -on -one visits in our clinic. So it's grown from, from there, but that was kind of our starting point that day. I can imagine. I mean, the excitement of watching people come in, people that you didn't even know were out there, um, so that's the whole purpose of uh, Nelson Campbell's Plan Pure Nation film, which, by the way, people can watch on YouTube. It's still there, it's still available. You can watch the entire film free of charge. And I'll put a link in the show notes because I think everyone should watch it. Even if you're not interested in being a pod leader, maybe you might want to join a pod in your area. And we'll include all the links so that you can have access to that. And so that's what Nelson says in the film. First, he sort of shows you the politics behind creating change. Here he comes um, in really providing evidence that eating this way, even if it's for 10 days, is enough to show that you can actually have an impact in your biometrics. And so he was testing individuals um, before and after the 10 day jump starts that he was doing and was able to show that you can drop cholesterol levels, you can improve your, um, your high blood pressure. Um, and I think even people were um, seeing changes in their A1C um, scores. And so 
at the end of the film, the end, he says, it has to start with us. It has to start at a grassroots level to create change. We can't expect change to happen from the top down. It has to start with us down here. And so you were motivated and moved by the film as well enough to create your own pod. And so tell us a little bit more of how you offer that support. Tell us how yours was unique. So we, when we started, um, I think it, it did come to be the, uh, the format settled in early on. We would do um, a, a whole food plant-based potluck with a time for fellowship. And you know, just letting people have that opportunity to talk to their neighbors and learn from each other and, and just share. And then we would do uh, the second hour of our pod meetings would be education. So we'd have a, a speaker or we'd do a demo. Um, we'd, we'd bring somebody in virtually from outside the community. We'd have a panel discussion. So we did different things to just bring the education forward. Um, and, and as we saw the interest and the need, um, we started doing additional things outside of our monthly pod meetings, and that included uh, lectures at our local libraries. We, we did a series, we did some lectures at the YMCA, um, participated in some health fairs, uh, and put information about the pod, information about plant-based eating, you know, out there in those, those settings. And one of the things that uh, we had in town, one of our grocery stores was offering uh, meal prep groups. And so they had different themes like comfort foods or I don't know what they were at the time, paleo and um, just, you know, different, different types of meal preps that people could sign up for. There was a database, they would pick their recipes. I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is ideal. We should have a plant-based meal prep group uh, because so many people, they, they want to eat a plant-based lifestyle, but they don't always know how to go about doing it. They maybe never developed the skills that uh, they would need for cooking a new way. Um, they didn't have resources for that, or they didn't have time to maybe spend time chopping or prepping. So the, the grocery store theme was, you know, you, we do the shopping and the, the chopping for you, and, you know, you come in and assemble and you, you get a meal. So I approached them about doing a, a whole food plant-based meal prep group and knowing that they didn't have recipes for that. And so I you know, collected a, a group of recipes and put it into the format that they would need. And basically it was some, uh, it was kind of a calculator. It would tell them how much to shop for. And then they would prep it for, I think we did six meals. And then we would um, let people sign up and however many people needed uh, you know, to sign up for that day, they would shop for that many. And so when we would arrive, uh, this was set up in stations of each, of each recipe. The ingredients were all there. And the recipe would sit there and you'd go um, pick a station and you would help assemble those meals. And so you would maybe make, uh, one of our staples was bean burgers and we'd uh, have chili or we'd have a salad, kind of, we did a little seasonal variation. So you'd come up to that station and maybe work with a partner and you would assemble however many meals needed to be done that night. So maybe there was a group of 12. So by the, by the time you were done, you would have all of your ingredients uh, ready for pickup. And so if we had six meals at the end of the session, you would just you know, make your way around the room and grab the, the packets for each of your meals. And you could go home with either a meal ready to eat, a meal ready to prepare, maybe you're gonna put in your crock pot or instant pot, or maybe you put it in the freezer for later. So this was really nice in that it gave people an opportunity in you know, an hour, hour and a half to make six meals for their families um, with very little effort. Uh, and they knew exactly what was in it too, right? The recipe was there. There was only items that we had agreed upon. It wasn't anything extra. They could do low salt. You know, it was, it was a way to give people an experience of healthy, good tasting food uh, that maybe they wouldn't do on their own. And the other really neat part, I think, about meal prep groups is that, again, the people share those social connections. So while they're doing these meal preps, they can talk about things food related, maybe, and they're talking about ingredients or how they choose one product over another or how they uh, you know, dress something up once they get it home to maybe make it their own. You know, maybe they add some different spices or something. Or what are the challenges when not everybody in your household eats the same way? You know, what can you do with these meals that would maybe satisfy somebody in your family who's an omnivore? So it, it gave people an opportunity to try something new, 
to learn how to do some food prep that maybe they didn't do before, practice some of those shopping skills if they wanted to, um, but then have a, you know, a standard set of recipes that they could use as go-tos because they knew what they should look like, what they should taste like, and they wouldn't be unknowns you know, going into the future. Right. Oh my goodness. I Can I attend? No, <laughs> I would have loved to have attended something like that. So, um, so you touched on uh, people not having the skills. I can see how people would benefit and enjoy coming together. And it's, you know, I'm not saying one is better than the other. Potlucks are wonderful because everyone prepares the food at home and then they share in their share, they share their food with other people. However, I like the approach that you are describing, and I would love to be able to do that maybe someday with my own group, which is everyone sees the raw foods or at least the raw ingredients and how everything's going to come together to to prepare a meal. Uh, And so you're sort of in a class setting. It reminds me of sort of like taking a cooking class, which I've done in the past, and you have other classmates there, other people that are preparing similar meals. Um, so I, so how eventually, like how successful was this group? Did more people join? Did people come from, um, far away to join in your meal preps? We had one, uh, friend of mine that lives an hour and a half away. She and her mom did come, uh, to one, um, you know, we, we had a limited space, um, size wise of what we could do. So I don't remember what we capped them at, um, but that location that I was at, uh, that store closed their, um, their sessions. They just weren't doing that program anymore. So we ended up having to move to a different, a different location. Um, and then there's a learning curve, right? Somebody new is trying to, um, figure out what the ingredients look like and what the processing part is. And then COVID came along, not too long after that. So, uh, we didn't do these during COVID. The store wasn't offering them. Uh, those those sessions. Um, so we haven't done any since then, but people have asked us how that things are getting better. Are we going to restart some of those? And so are you? Uh, we will see. Uh, we are just from our pod standpoint, uh, we had always done these in-person meetings and the first month, so today is what, the 11th? So today is two years from the date that the pandemic was declared. And Wow, two years. Uh, and okay. we had a, a virtual speaker lined up for that that month um, that was going to be, you know, while we're in person, she was going to be on the screen in front of us. And I didn't realize how unfamiliar virtual meetings and settings were to people in the general public. And so we, we switched it to being virtual that you could attend, you know, whatever platform it was. And we didn't have very many people attend. Um, I, I think a lot of people just didn't, I mean, everybody was really trying to figure out what this pandemic even meant. Uh, so we, we had some speakers lined up, but um, our, our attendance hadn't been great at that one. And I personally got very, very busy around that time. So we ended up thinking, you know, it's like everybody else, okay, things will settle down. We'll get back to quote unquote normal. Uh, and then as the pandemic just stretched on, we continued to communicate like through our Facebook uh, group or, um, you know, some small things, but really just kept waiting for those in-person events to return. So last, this past summer of 2021, uh, rather than bringing people back indoors, we held some outdoor events that we just were picnics. We didn't do an educational part. It was just an opportunity for people to come back together, bring their food and, you know, have that community and um, see their friends uh, in that setting. Uh, we had um, a pretty significant surge here recently and you know that's finally settled down so we just restarted our in-person pod meetings uh, March of 2022 uh, we had a bring your own food and kind of took a poll of the folks attending to see what people would be comfortable with and we'll be restarting those potlucks um, in April I think you kind of already emphasized Dr. True that you haven't done a lot I can say the same thing for me I I've kept the pod the um I've kept the podcast going. As a matter of fact, I've been able to really invest time um, into what I want to do in terms of offering support for just anyone who listens. I've done some sort of interactive cooking demos with other people that partner with me through StreamYard, and that's been a lot of fun. But it, it it's work. It's a lot of work to do anything, and you stay busy. Are you still seeing patients? My clinic part, I had been doing CHIP. 
uh, as as the part of that clinic. And with the pandemic, I was not asking people to gather. So I didn't go virtual with that either. But in the midst of this, the day after the pandemic, I um, had started working with the health department too. And so the patients I see right now are uh, refugee immigrant uh, patients uh, that are coming into the clinic setting there. Um, so I'm hoping to get back to the chip or um, uh, PIVIO uh, this year um, and get that rebooted too. It's been, a, it's been an interesting couple of years, right? <laughs> It, it really has been. It's, uh, I don't know, everyone's experience is different. For me, it's been, you know, having to reevaluate my life, what's important, where am I going uh, with all of this? What What's it been like for you? Yeah, you know, so um, I live uh, on the border of two states that took different approaches to the pandemic. And so there were challenges that we saw just locally because of that from economic perspectives, um, the way businesses were open, the way masks were approached. Uh, and and we really, from like a, even the lifestyle medicine standpoint, I saw very early on those those chronic disease factors that were so important in, in how people were being impacted by, by the COVID uh, pandemic. And also the, the challenges from uh, social determinants of health, if that is a, a phrase that you're familiar with, you know, the the differences in, in people's health based upon where they are in their lives and what's available to them and what's accessible to them. Uh, you know, do they have access to medical care? Do they have access to healthy foods? Do they live in a food desert? Are they impacted by toxins in their environment? And as we saw, many of the folks that are our essential workers um, were very dramatically impacted by not being able to stay home or work from home that you know, they had to be out in, in the community um, interacting with others during that very unknown time. And we saw those impacts on, on different parts of our, our population, especially early, of who was getting really sick and who had higher risks of death from this virus. So I think it made me even more aware of how we need a lifestyle medicine plant-based approach that is easily accessible to everyone. You know, it, it can't be something that because you have access to you know, a full-fledged grocery store rather than I'm going to the gas station to get my meals or a fast food restaurant, we need to make sure that, that those choices that are so important to health are available to everyone. Absolutely. Excellent point. I'm so glad that you brought that up. I feel like, for example, you know, we talk about veganism. We're both ethical vegans. We care about our planet. But we also care about our health. And so that's partly why on my podcast, I wanted to emphasize lifestyle medicine is that um, we're helping every we're helping every aspect of that veganism um, goal that we have that vision of helping the animals and the planet by taking care of ourselves. And so um, I think, yes, what you just said was very clear that our health has to be important to us if we're going to continue to have the, these sort of pandemics that um, can, you know, quickly kill us if we, we're not uh, building up our immune systems. You also um, are a contributor to this book that I just got, um, The Improving Women's Health Across the Lifespan. It was recently published uh, by a lot of the physicians from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine's Women's Interest Group. Um, and I might have said, Dr. Chu, that many of our listeners are women. And, uh, and then women are the, the ones, not always, but the ones that bring this health information into their homes. They're still sort of the primary people who go out and do the groceries and do the meal prepping. And so we want to get this information out to women and support them. I love this chapter that you contributed to. It's on community engagement and women's health. And you and the reason I bring it up right now is because you just talked about how you take into consideration where people are, where patients are in terms of having access to good food, having access just to, to health in general. Um, so in this chapter, you see health disparities uh, being addressed, and you also address um, being culturally sensitive when it comes to the foods that you prescribe, the recipes that you prescribe to patients. Those are two topics that I, I said to you early on that I want to continue to talk about on this podcast. 
So can we explore this chapter a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, I think the, the importance of that, that community engagement is something we talked about a little bit ago, too, is that um, often, especially in medicine, it's almost like this top-down approach, you know, very paternalistic here. I'm the expert. I'm, I'm telling you what you should do to deal with, you know, this disease. But if you look at what helps succeed in those communities, and especially in communities that face a lot of challenges, is that the, the people that are living that experience, they have to be able to be the um, contributors and decision makers to that. So, you know, how do we bring things together and meet in the middle? We find out what our community members need. And if the uh, materials and resources aren't available or it's not something that um, I'm even interested in, you know, I don't want to do your program because it's, it's not something that I see as a benefit to me. So if we look at places that uh, our communities could really, you know, from a plant-based standpoint, if we went into an area of town that is a food desert and say, you know, hey, are you interested in eating more fresh fruits and vegetables? And they say yes. And you ask where they get them and there's nothing around that they can access. It's really going to be challenging for that person to increase that intake and say, well, you know, what's another option? Can you eat frozen? Can you eat canned? You know, where are those even accessible? So even just building the relationships with the, the people in our communities to understand, um, number one, what, what people want, uh, number two, you know, what they have access to, and number three, is there something that could be changed to help um, bring those resources to that person uh, or ways to think about approaches? Um, and there's many really great approaches out there uh, of, of ways to, um, number one, assess, you know, asking folks what they want, and then using the community members to come together to make those things a reality. Uh, and this takes a lot of work, right? It's not something that you just throw together and boom, everything is better. We know that there are hurdles and challenges. So having this framework, and there's a couple of different models uh, you know, discussed in there and some steps that some lifestyle medicine physicians have uh, put out there in their research and in their work that have been effective. And so building upon some of those success stories, but really tackling it from a perspective of your own community and the unique uh, features that exist um, can help people to build some of those programs um, so that they become sustainable too. And I think about uh, communities that maybe, um, this was something I was reading about during the pandemic where some people live in apartment buildings where maybe they're, they're sharing a kitchen with the floor or even a bathroom with the floor. And if anything happens to that one shared facility, you know, they're going to have to go to another floor to even do their cooking or something. So, you know, if we don't understand that maybe our patient lives in that setting and you're saying, here, go home and cook a plant-based meal. And they're thinking, I don't even have a way to get fresh fruits and vegetables. I don't have a way to open a can, much less warm something up. I don't see that as sustainable for me, but yet that may not be something they're comfortable sharing with you. So really um, being able to engage at our, our community level gives us a perspective of um, a person's own vision and goals for their health, providing the education as to the why something may be important, but helping to fit it into that uh, appropriate um, perspective. Uh, there are many cultural, like you mentioned, there's cultural aspects. Food is not just food. Food is, it's a gathering, it's an experience, it's a comfort, it's, it's, it's what we do sometimes more than just the fuel or calories for what we eat. And so if we ask people to change something that is so special to them uh, in a way that is very foreign, you know, we don't want to adopt those types of things. So making sure that we understand on, you know, from that community engagement level uh, that we're meeting where everybody wants to be. Absolutely. So beautifully said. I, and I think of, uh, for example, the patient. So here, here's the physician on one side, here's the patient on the other side, and the physician is saying to the patient, this, you know, these lifestyle modalities will help with a condition that you're, you're dealing with. Go home and put those in practice. And, you know, those two individuals may never run in the same social circles. They might have very different experiences. And so it means nothing sometimes to the patient to be told by an individual who doesn't understand their reality. 
but I feel like the pod network helps to fill in that need. And then you you have that added bonus that you are a pod leader and you're the physician. Yeah, you know, and as you said, walk the walk, it reminded me of being involved with walk with a doc. You know, another kind of grassroots type uh, effort to get out into your community and to engage with other other people. And for your listeners that aren't familiar, uh, this was a uh, this is an organization that was formed um, by a cardiologist in Columbus, Ohio, who was you know always trying to get his patients to be active and to get out and and exercise and move and and he would often find that they didn't and so he says you know my family and I are going to go out Saturday to the park and we're going to go for a walk come and join us and uh, it people came and so kind of like the pod you know like I'm sitting there in the audience going okay I'm going to make this pod and if people come um, Dr. Sabger found people came and so you know over time this actually grew into a, an organization a nonprofit organization that like the pod network is global now um, and different communities have different walk with the doc chapters and group leaders and part of it is about education so leading with some health topic and then going for a walk you know doing a physical activity talking while you're walking it gives physicians and other clinicians a, a time frame to you know they're off the clock they're not uh, poking away their computers, there's not a stethoscope, they're not watching the time, they're just engaging in, in conversation. And for, for providers, it can be a time to talk about things in an expanded moment. You know, if you just have 15 minutes to see somebody, it's really hard to say all those things that you would really like to relate to them. But if you're walking with somebody for an hour and walking with a group, you can really have a nice conversation and it gives people the opportunity to ask questions that they wouldn't have time to ask, you know, in a clinic visit either. And then again, it's that social connections. They're learning from each other. They're uh, engaging in an activity with other people, which can help improve their desire to do that. You know, Hey, I'm going to see my, my new friends. When I go, I'm going to have this opportunity. I'm going to be in the sunshine or, or maybe the snow or the rain, you know, whichever. Um, but I'm going to be, I'm going to, um, get something from this, right? I'm getting activity, I'm getting information. And some of the research that they've been doing shows that people do walk away with improvements in knowledge. They increase some of their activity even outside of those walks. So again, that community engagement, there's somebody that maybe uh, has a leadership role and then that community role, but coming together to have a shared experience. And just because somebody is the leader doesn't mean they're not learning just as much as the people who are, are walking or attending a pod meeting with them. You know, you can learn, it, it, it kind of levels that playing field. We can all learn from each other. We all have experiences to share. We all have uh, strengths that maybe somebody else doesn't have that, that really help us to build um, some of those, those connections that help us all thrive. I'm so glad you brought that up. I love Walk with the Doc. Um, you probably know we also have a chapter here in the Dallas area, and uh, I love it. I love getting out there. We have put, uh, unfortunately, the last two years, it's it, we've had the walks going. We've halted them. It's just been back and forth. I, but I also was following my husband's recommendations um, because we wanted to practice, you know, safety first. Um, have you resumed your walks? Um, I, I have not. I'm hoping... This is March, uh, probably April. Uh, this is what I'm shooting for. You know, hopefully we get some decent weather. And I'm in the Midwest, so you never know what April will bring. Um, but hopefully that uh, that time frame will work out. And you know, maybe even exploring some new partnerships as ways to draw in um, additional additional people that maybe wouldn't have heard about these ahead of time. You know, kind of like with with the pods. How are people finding you? How are you advertising? I am not a marketing person. Um, getting the word out there in different ways doesn't come naturally to me. So, you know, looking at ways that your participants uh, tell others, you know, kind of that word of mouth using social media um, or a podcast, <laughs> right? Actually, our pod, um, Heartland Rooted has a podcast. Uh, we have two of our um, members, two of our board members that uh, are doing a podcast uh, that I don't remember how many episodes they've had out. Uh, but at our first in-person pod meeting this year in March, 
you know, we had our bring your own food. And then instead of an educational component, they recorded their podcast live uh, in front of our pod members that day. So you'll have to take a listen. I'll, I'll have to yeah. send you a link for that. But um, what did you say the name was? Uh, Heartland Rooted Plant-Based Podcast. Dan Arnold and Bob Fight are the two um, that are doing the podcast. Yeah, and that was interesting when when I did the interview, you know, to be a pod leader, uh, one of the questions was, you know, what's the name of your pod? And uh, I didn't know what to come up with, you know, kind of tossed around all these this, this, and this. And I'm like, here we are, you know, we're in, we're in the heartland. And Heartland Rooted just somehow came out of that. And one of our board members had a relative who made our logo for us, which, you know, we're a bi-state community, Iowa, Illinois, and it has a has a beach with the boats running through because we've got the Mississippi River that runs through our community. So I think it, whatever that spontaneity of, of moment to name the pod, um, I think it really has represented kind of where we are and, and who we are and what plant-based eating really can do even in the midst of, you know, we're the breadbasket of America. We grow a lot of corn, but there are also a lot of <laughs> cows and pigs and chickens around here too. Oh, well, I am going to have to check it out. And I'll put a link to your podcast um, in the show notes as well. And so coming back as we're wrapping up, coming back to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, because I love to promote when their uh, conferences are coming, coming back to that, did you say that you were part of you attended the very first conference they had in 2013? I did not. I, I think that they had a conference in 2012 that was in maybe Denver. Um, I, this is my recollection is they had like 125 people. We did one, the 2013 one was in um, Alexandria near DC. And it just since then has, has taken off. I want to say there's 6,000 members of the, of the college or more. Um, conferences are capped by attendance and, you know, location wise, 1400 or something, 1500 for this upcoming year. Um, but it's, it's a, a field that has grown, even if it says American College of Lifestyle Medicine, doesn't mean it's just physicians, uh, physicians, nurses, dietitians, nutritionists, uh, physical occupational therapists, pharmacists, health coaches, um, healthcare executives, uh, other people that are involved in inpatient care or even community uh, level support of, of that lifestyle medicine message are members. So it's it's a wonderful organization that I think has has changed my trajectory and, and allowed me to meet people from even this American college around the world uh, that, that focus on lifestyle medicine and really want to see that as that foundation of, of health and health care. I'm a member of, the, of ACLM as well and part of the Women's Health Interest Group, and that has been very meaningful to, to meet with other members that are physicians and practitioners who are very active with, uh, with patients and really wanting to support women's health. And so I always, any chance I get to mention all of that, I, I do. And the upcoming conference is still scheduled to happen in Orlando, Florida in November. And I'm hoping to be there. Uh, any chance that you'll go? I know that it's so hard to make any kind of definite kind of decisions right now. I'm planning on being there. <laughs> Looking forward to it. And actually, we would have been in your town uh, if we would have been able to be there this past year. I know. Oh, my goodness. I don't want to think about it. But yes. And then in terms of in person, just in general, last year, I went to a podcaster's um, conference in person in Nashville in between the spikes and everything else. I don't know if the Delta had been in place yet. It was in August of last year and I loved it. But there were so many wonderful measures that were put in place uh, to really keep distance, um, uh, to keep your distance from people. They even had headsets so you can, you can dial into the speaker you wanted to hear and, and watch the person from a distance without ever being around the crowd. They had buttons that you can wear to, to tell people whether you were uh, wanting to be approached at a certain distance or not, if you wanted to be left alone. You know, you had mentioned that when we talked before and I loved the idea <laughs> of the buttons. So when we gathered in May or in March for our first in-person, I had shared that with our uh, host committee. And so they had gone out and bought the little, you know, my name is name tags in red, green, and yellow. And then they had a little thing like above our, 
our little display that said, you know, pick your name kid color based upon your comfort level. And it said, you know, I'm hugs are okay, uh, fist bump, or I'm keeping my distance, you know, whatever the, the three items were. And so you could see as you walked up what, what people's comfort levels were in that setting. And, and you didn't have to ask, right? It, and if somebody with a red one came up on and hugged you anyway, you know, you knew that that was okay with them. Uh, so that's awesome. Pod leaders, as they're looking to re-engage, maybe they could um, consider doing something that, that helps people indicate their comfort level. You know, it's so funny that you put that in place and I haven't. And um, because we were still, like I said, back and forth doing our walks. And sometimes you could tell that a person wanted to be a little away from the rest of the group and the buttons would have been nice to have even at that time. So maybe I'm going to borrow that idea too. <laughs> but yeah, that'd be even for the outdoor stuff, uh, yeah. giving people that, that comfort zone. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. Well, Dr. True, this has been wonderful. Before we wrap up, um, I want to know, do you have a final message for our listeners? And um, some of our listeners could be pod leaders that um, are sort of feeling a little bit shy about doing anything either in person or online. How can we continue to encourage pod leaders to uh, realize that they can continue to have an impact uh, in their own community? Yeah, you know, I think number one, being um, being a pod leader or looking at being a pod leader is something that you can make it fit you. You know, you, there's not a cut and dried um, cookie cutter that says what your pod has to be like. Be creative, think outside the box, make it work for you and the community members that you want to serve. You know, ask if you know of others, you know, what what would be helpful to them? How could they help you? I think that's also very important that finding your finding your community so you don't have to do this all alone. It's very challenging sometimes if people think that they're the only one that's going to take on something big. Um, I, I think you'll find that in communities there are many people willing to help out and willing to pick up a role that suits their strengths. Uh, you, you can work to your strengths and find other people to complement those areas that maybe you aren't as strong in. Yes, that's wonderful. The whole collaboration and partnerships is key. I think sometimes as leaders, we think we can do it all ourselves and then we experience burnout. If people want to learn more about you or your businesses, we, because we didn't touch on those, I don't know if you would like to touch on your businesses, um, but what, uh, what websites, what email or anything, what would you like to share with people in case they want to learn more about you or your Facebook group? Uh, you know, from a standpoint of Heartland Rooted, we do have uh, heartlandrooted.com uh, and heartlandrooted at gmail.com. You can reach out to us there. We have a Facebook page uh, that's open to, to the public and then a Facebook group that's closed, but you can you know, ask to join. There's a couple of questions. Uh, have you seen Plant Your Nation? And what's your favorite vegetable, I think, are the two questions that you would have to answer. Wonderful. I'll, I'll make sure to put all those links in the show notes. And Dr. True, again, it's been wonderful to be able to get to know you and to learn about your story. And now that you're a PAC member, I'm looking forward to working together with you and learning more about uh, the different talents that you have to bring to the table so that we can support pot leaders. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you. And I really have enjoyed talking with you. And I look forward to engaging further in the pack. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us to grow this pod network and, and really support people out there to do the good work that they do. You've been listening to the Healthy Lifestyle Solutions podcast with your host, Maya Acosta. If you've enjoyed this podcast, do us a favor and share with one friend who can benefit from this episode. Feel free to leave an honest review as well at rate this podcast.com forward slash HLS. This helps us to spread our message. And as always, thank you for being a listener.